Okay, so to start off, let's consider this model that I'd sent out to the class, which looks at uh, an autoregressive process. So remember the last time we were talking, we had merely said that factor one, factor two, and factor three were correlated over the course of time. And instead of those covariances, now we're putting paths in. Now, it's in order to have this model be identified, we're going to have to make some constraints here. So the way that we identified this model at time one was to freely estimate all of these loadings and to fix the variance at one. And when we change this into an autoregressive model, we can no longer fix the disturbance here to one because as I talked about before, the variance of F2 is not the variance of this error term. It's going to be AR1 times one times AR1 plus one times the variance of here times one. So in order to fit that model, if you want to have the first measurement occasion have a variance of one, you're going to have to have an additional equality constraint. And so in this case, to fit a configural model, I have to fix loading one to be loading four to be loading seven. So strictly speaking, this configural model is only configural in the sense that the amount of variance due to the latent variables involved is going to be some complex of all of the tracing rules up here. I've, I've got to have this equality constraint. Alternatively, you could freely estimate the variance at factor one and constrain one of the loadings to be one. And that's more or less equivalent to saying, you know, I have to assume that there's a, a loading that's invariant across time. Uh, let me just run this so we can take a look at it. So similarly, you know, if we're doing the loadings, that's all of the loadings being equal over the course of time. So that one doesn't change from what we had talked about before. And strict invariance also doesn't change. So if we look at our results under strict invariance, here's our loadings. Let me select everything and move it down just a little bit. So in terms of this invariance, I've got a Haywood case up here. I've got a negative variance there. Um, let me take a look at this. Oh, it's hiding. I've got to move this parameter over to where we can see it. Come here. Come on, come on, come on. Well, it's not letting me grab it for some reason this morning, but it's the number that's hiding behind that path over there. Um, Try one more time. No, it's not letting me do it this morning. Um, but so as we talked about last time, this paths adjo adjoint to adjoining addition, subsequent measurement occasions are AR1 paths. And the path from F1 to F3 is an AR2 path, an, an autoregressive of lag length two. So that's really all that you know goes on in fitting such a model. Uh, if we come downstairs and look at our model fits, we again have pretty much the same thing going on in terms of the fit statistics. Uh, everything fits really well, and even the strict invariance model fits fairly well. But that was just a way of showing that. So what I'd like to do now is to consider the fact this isn't discussed in Lowland's treatment that 
we're now going to consider putting the mean in the model because we have means at all of these occasions. So the other file that I had sent to you was this file, which goes back to looking at these as correlated factors. But now notice that all of the manifest variables have intercepts down here associated with them. And upstairs, I have some means over here. So in order to put the mean in the model and compare various invariance hypotheses upstairs where I'm allowing everything to be free, I'm going to have to say, in order to identify this model, if these three loadings are exactly different and all of these intercepts are different, if I'm going to fit that kind of a, of a model where everything is free to vary down here, I'm also going to have to come upstairs and say that the mean for the factor at time two is zero and the factor variance is one in order to have an identified model. Similarly, if I come back in and I start looking at only the loadings being the same and the intercepts being different, I'm again going to have to come in and say that the mean at factor two and factor three is equal to zero and the factor variance is equal to one. I can free that up. I can allow the factor variances to be different if I would like. So let's copy all of this. And that will run as well. So in terms of this model, I can say, uh, the variance in 1974 and 1976 is getting smaller over the course of time. So let's take a look at the mean. Well, if I'm going to try to fit a model where I want to estimate the means and variances of the latent variable being different, I'm going to have to impose some constraints on these intercepts. So one easy way of doing that is to come in and say that B7, and let me say this in words, B72 represents an interval scaled measurement. So it's like a yardstick that has been broken at a certain period, but that break, that intercept is the same over the course of time. So that's why I have I1 being constrained to I4, being constrained to I7. And similarly for crime in 1972, that is also an interval level scale only. And the break, the shift, if you will, for that variable is constrained to be the same across measurement occasion. And similarly for I3, I6, and I9. Well, now that I've made this assumption about measurement, now that I say that these are all rulers that are measuring some continuous quantity, I can come upstairs and start looking at means. Well, in order for this factor over here to be identified, with all of these three things being freely estimated, I need to impose the constraint that you know, measurement occasion one is a reference measurement occasion. So I'm going to constrain that to zero. And because all of these three loadings are freely estimated, I'm fixing that variance to be one. However, at time two, I can freely estimate the mean and the variance. And this mean and variance will be scaled relative to time one. So time one is kind of my control group. And the same song second verse happens for 1976. So let's take a look at the parameter estimates for that and the interpretation. So this is the college only sample. At time one, we have a latent variable and we're going to say for purposes of talking about this, that has a mean of zero and a variance of one. And in 1972 and 1974, that mean is increasing. So for the college population of people that they looked at, 
over time, they are becoming more liberal. That 0.07 and 0.10 represents a z-score change because at time one, that latent variable had a mean of zero and variance of one. Similarly, for the variances, the variance at time two is 0 0.89 and the variance at time three is 0.93. So the variances are decreasing slightly over the course of time. So the, the advantage of this is that we get to use latent variable modeling to talk about mean level differences in our latent variable, <clears throat> as well as variability. And you know, those estimates of the mean level change and the variance, because they are latent variables, are not contaminated by measurement error. The variance of busing in 1972, for example, is 1.56 times 1 times 1.56 plus 1.58. So the fact that I can freely estimate these error variances down here give me an explanation for you know, why variation in a manifest variable might change over the course of time, but I can ignore it because that variability is due to measurement error. So at some measurement occasions in this population, 1972, for example, measurement error seems to be a little bit larger than measurement error at time two or time three for these three variables. And our estimate of the degree of correlation between the latent variables is adjusting for the fact that for some of these items, there appears to be correlations between the manifest variables. Let me come downstairs and look at, oh, I didn't request the standardized solution, but I can do that now. Okay. So, you know, there's a 0.5 correlation on the bu school busing item from 1972 to 1974, but, you know, if you just looked at that school busing correlation, it's larger than the correlation that you would expect by the tracing rules here. So the true score correlation is 0 0.76 times 0 0.74 times 0.84. But if you actually looked at the correlation in the data based on this model, it would be 0 0.76 times 94 times 84 plus one times 0 0.5 times one. So that explains why you know, that particular indicator shows a larger than expected correlation. So does that help? This is you know, an example of longitudinal invariance. Yes, it has oh, a lot. Right. Okay, all right. Um, so let's turn now to the handout and talk a little bit more about multi-group invariance in the case, in this case of a two predictor regression model. So if we go back to this model, it's been a little bit of time since I've chatted with you about this. So let's rehearse where we're at so we can run into the next part. If we're looking at invariance, we might think that the mean of our predictor variable can be different, but yet the same functional relationship obtains and the same variability obtains. And maybe we're interested only in knowing whether my predictor variable is related to my criterion variable with the same slope across the groups, even though there's a difference in elevation. And a position of skepticism or a position that says, actually, you're going to have to construct a separate regression model for men and women happens when my unstandardized slope changes. So if we think about this in terms of a path model form, here's what our diagram might look like. I might draw this diagram for men and for women. And let's take a, a look for just a little bit and think about what this diagram is doing as a single measure. You're used to seeing a sling 
on this predictor variable and this predictor variable. And in this model, what I've done is to snap in a little bit of a puzzle piece here that explains the variance of this predictor. So in this model, the variance of pleasant feeling is going to be 0.99 times one times 0.99. So this loading represents the standard deviation of this variable. And similarly, for this diagram, instead of the variance of mixed gatherings fun being freely estimated, I've estimated this model with a latent variable with a variance of one and a loading. So this model is saying that the variance of mixed gatherings fun is 0.88 times one times 0.88. These two numbers represent the standard deviation. <clears throat> and the reason I did that is if you just concentrate on this upper part of the diagram, this is a puzzle piece we've seen earlier in the book that this part of the diagram allows me to interpret this path, this covariance between these two variables as a correlation coefficient because this variable has a variance of one and this variable has a variance of one. And whenever we join two variables with a variance of one by a sling, the result is a correlation coefficient. Similarly, let's talk about these three paths, the news. Well, this model says that the mean of pleasant feeling is 2.84 and the mean of makes gatherings fun is 3.13. And this path down here represents the intercept of the criterion variable. This represents the unstandardized regression weight, and this is an unstandardized regression weight. So if we think about this box and this box and the one and this box, we've seen that before. That's a two predictor regression model. Now, the reason that I set this up this way is this allows me to then fit various struct multi group structural equation models. So I can say, for example, over here on the model equality, I'm just going to have the model regression weights be the same across groups. Well, if I do that as a multi-group model, that's going to say that this model, this regression weight is the same as that. And everything else about the model can be different. <clears throat> that is the correlations can be different, the standard deviations can be different and so forth. So this is, at a minimum saying, hey, regardless of the fact that maybe men drink more than women and that the variation and covariation between the predictors is different across men and women, I've still got the same regression slopes going on. Well, looking at that as a multi-group model, if this was a single group model, this would have zero degrees of freedom. And if this was a single group model, it would also have zero degrees of freedom. But because I'm constraining this loading, this path to be the same as that path, that gives me a degree of freedom in the same song second verse for this path. So that's why this regression weight has two degrees of freedom. And the chi-square on that is 4.83. That's a really nice fit. Uh, and the TLI is also fairly good. Next model, well, now I can say, maybe there is different amounts of variation in these predictors across the two, but the correlation coefficient is what is, I'm going to say is the same across groups. Well, that gives me one more degree of freedom. That gives me three degrees of freedom and a different slightly, slightly higher chi-square, but not by much. Coming down to this next model, <coughs> I can now say the variance covariance matrix of the predictors is the same. In other words, I'm, I'm going to add the additional constraint that these standard deviations are the same across men and women. All of a sudden, that's a really bad idea. I have a chi-square of 23 and five degrees of freedom. <clears throat> so even though I have kind of a TLI that's in the ballpark, I might on the basis of a chi-square difference test want to say, hey, you know, that's really not a great idea. Let's come downstairs here and say the regression weights and the intercept are the same. 
So what we're focusing now is saying this regression weight, this regression weight, and this intercept is the same across all the groups, but everything else is different upstairs in terms of variation and covariation of the predictors, as well as the means of the predictor variables. <clears throat> well, that's also you know, not a great model, 88 degrees of freedom with 88 chi-square with three degrees of freedom and a TLI that's very low. And finally, my regression, well, next to finally, my regression weights, variance, covariance matrix, and means of the predictors being the same also would give me seven degrees of freedom. And finally, a strict invariance model that everything about the model this regression weight is equal to that regression weight is a really lousy model. So men and women are different somehow on these in terms of these regression predictors. So I can conduct chi-square difference tests that we've talked about before. If I would like, some of these models are not nested with other models and I could refer to the BIC and look at the lowest model and make my decisions about which regression weight would hold for that. So that's, you know, an ex a tiny example of just using regression in that model. So let's talk about latent variable models and what I'm presenting now is the fact that there are many ways to set up a multi-group invariance model. And you might want to think about that when you do it. So in the example that we started off the class with three times of measurement with the same variables, you might want to consider looking at the longitudinal invariance of your models within group and then constructing a grand model. If you have the same questions that are, are given in terms of format, maybe you want to consider a model where say all of the intercepts for that area for the that factor are constrained to be the same as a possible way of you know constructing a parsimonious model and i you know if you would like to read some things here's a general historical overview a lot of this came into the fore in around 1971 uh, with Carl Uriskog and Dag Serbom. And Uriskog did this for the deviation score matrix for the confirmatory factor model. And Serbom had an article where he starts to put the mean in. Serbom never considered longitudinal data. So he kind of, he considered manifest variables that were at ratio level of measurement. <clears throat> and Roger Mil the late Roger Millsap, did a really nice paper on multi-group discussion. So that gives you some articles that you might you know, want to refer to when you start publishing your work. This is a really nice article uh, that's in the reference section, which talks about all of the different ways that you can do multi-group invariance models. And this paper has a little checklist for your programming options across various platforms. And that's kind of a nice thing to take a look at. I'm going to present here in this chapter, a way to reason your way through a multi-group model. So if you're only interested in looking at variation and covariation, then you're going to want to not put the mean in the model, that is freely estimate all of the manifest variable intercept, intercepts and leave the mean out. If however, you're interested in looking at mean level changes, then you're going to have to start playing around with the intercepts. So in words, if you're comparing say factor structure of college educated or non-college educated people, and you just want to say, I'm looking at this in terms of explaining variation and covariation, regression paths, and that's it. Then look only at factorial invariance based on the deviation score matrix, freely estimate all the intercepts. On the other hand, if you want to say, I want my model 
to talk about how college educated and non-college educated groups differ in terms of their endorsement of liberal political beliefs, then you are going to have to play with the intercepts. Now, as I said before in the example, when you're looking at mean level differences at the factor level, you're going to have to make some kind of assumption about a common interval scale. And that's done by constraining the intercepts, man, the, a manifest variable intercept to be the same across group. Uh, and you know, that's only one, one of many possibilities that you can take a look at. There are other times when you might not want to actually believe that your data represent an interval level scale. And that happens in the case of variables that are ratio level, for example. If you're looking at some physical property like the weight of a child or the height of a child, a zero has a meaningful point, has a meaningful interpretation then. And as you construct your structural equation model, you might want to specify the model with the intercept fixed at zero. So here's a little table that people said that they liked that summarizes the Vandenberg and Lance paper. What you've got down here is the type of invariance model, configural, just meaning that the path diagram has the same paths across groups, but everything else can be different the metric model, the relative metric model, strong invariance, strict invariance, and complete or total invariance. So these are words that you can use in describing how groups differ. In configural invariance, the loadings have the same pattern, but you can allow those variances to be different, those loadings to be different across the groups. Metric invariance means that the path diagram is the same for the two groups and all of the respective loadings in the diagram are constrained to be the same across groups. And everything else can be different. Relative metric invariance is what we were talking about in the regression above or in the investigation over time. What I'm going to do is I'm going to fix the loadings to be the same across groups or over time. And I'm going to fix the intercepts to be the same across groups. And then I'm going to pick one group where the mean is zero and all the other groups have a mean that's freely estimated. And one group that has a variance of one and all the other groups have freely estimated models. So relative metric invariance is kind of an attractive place to be because, <clears throat> at least for me, because then your diagram is saying something to the reader about how these groups differ in the magnitude of the latent variable differences and the variation in latent variable differences across groups. But because the factor loadings are constrained to be the same, they're the manifest variables are behaving as the same measurement indicators. Strong invariance happens if I'm going to fix the loadings and the intercepts and the variances and the, I'm sorry, the mean levels and the variances to all be the same. So that's saying that the only thing that's different across say men and women is the fact that the measurement error in the manifest variables could be different, but in all other respects, it's the same latent variable, the same amount of variation, the same overall level. Strict or total invariance involves looking at everything except the error variances, covariances being different. So notice I don't have a check mark here. 
And total invariance means everything about the entire two diagrams is the same. So, I mean, I'll throw it open. Is that helpful in terms of summarizing, you know, introducing the terms and summarizing the values? All right. So <clears throat> let's go a little bit more into the discussion here. Some people, you know, the Vandenberg article notes that some people say in their first step, I'm going to test whether the variance covariance matrix is different or the same. And the thinking here is that if the covariance matrices are not significant, dif significantly different, you don't need to do all the structural equation modeling. So mechanically, what you would do is you would draw a path diagram with all of the variances and covariances present across the manifest variables. You wouldn't have any latent variables. And you do the same for the other group <clears throat> and you would constrain all of the means and all of the variances and covariances to be the same across the group. And if that model fits well, then you're done. You can just say whatever it is, these things, these, these two variance covariance matrices are homogeneous. And that's made in absence of having to draw any factor models. And you know, what follows here is what I had said with respect to the table that I just introduced that Configural invariance is just saying the loadings are the same. And I have a few things to say about that. The configural invariance is attractive if you have it. I mean, it, it sure beats having to conclude that everything's completely different. But configural invariance happens if you have selection effects present across the groups. So say, for example, you're studying men and women and to you know, justify my men are kind of derelict people, men happen to not want to participate in your study nearly as much as women. And maybe men who engage in bad behaviors are systematically less likely to be in your study. That's known as a selection effect. And those selection effects are going to affect the estimation of your loadings. You could say, well, the reason that the loadings look a little different is you know, the men didn't participate as much as the women, and the women are more of a representative sample. Even if selection effects are present, you should still get a pattern of configural invariance. That is, a loading that's positive in one group is never going to be negative in another group. The worst thing that can possibly happen under selection effects is that you have a zero loading, but they're never going to flip and you're also not going to get loadings that are present in one group that are not present or you know, more complex in another group. And that's why, you know, at least at a minimum, configural invariance is a good thing to have. But it's better to have some kind of metric invariance or factorial invariance. <clears throat> and that's why, you know, you're, you're kind of hoping that you can at least get the loadings to be the same across the groups. And I believe I've talked about strong invariance and strict invariance in the table. Uh, and if you, when you're writing this up and talking to people, Meredith's 1993 article is where you'd go for those original terms. Now, invariance, when you run this in practice, you probably aren't going to get it to happen that absolutely everything is going to be the same across groups. So this gets you into the field of looking at partial invariance, that maybe some subset of your items are the same or different across groups. There's a couple of ways of looking at this. You could fit a model that's an invariance model and then go in and look at what are called modification indices 
for some clues as to what loadings might be different across the groups. Or you can look at the predicted and actual correlation matrices, if you only got a few variables, for some clues as to why that invariance model isn't working for some particular manifest variables. And that's okay. I mean, the at a minimum, when you're fitting invariance models, if you can constrain even some of the loadings to be the same, you at least have a basis for comparing the means and variances, even though the conceptual interpretation of other manifest variables might be slightly different across the groups. Following that, you know, in at the top of the hour, we talked about longitudinal invariance, uh, where we're looking at a model. So if we're looking at a factor model for men and women, here is you know, one of my reasons for drinking scales. And in terms of a path diagram, I rather like this way of drawing them, <clears throat> that I'm going to put a lots of little triangles here to indicate the manifest variable intercepts. And upstairs, the manifest variable, <clears throat> sorry, the latent variable mean and the latent variable difference. So notice about this model <clears throat> that I've got the loadings constrained to be the same and the intercepts constrained to be the same. And that then allows me to look at the mean level for the other group and the variance. So this model in terms of social reasons for drinking says that women score a Z, an average z-score of minus 2.8 relative to men, and women are slightly more variable in their reasons for social drinking. And my manifest variable intercepts down here are different across the two studies. You know, so celebrating special occasions, for example, seems to have a little more measurement error variance for women than it does for men. And I can constrain, you know, I, I can specify my various invariance hypotheses with chi squares, you know, degrees of freedom and TLIs, as well as RMSEAs for these models as well in the following fashion. This basically follows what we were talking about with the Amos diagram above. So if you have questions, let me know, but you know, this, these would be your, your models. <clears throat> As always, whenever you're doing a model, it's important to go in and take a look at the influence diagnostics. <clears throat> so if I take out those individuals who have influential observations, my conclusions about the model are rather different. So just based on the entire data set, the BIC I would land on is relative invariance. If I throw out individuals who have influential observations, so instead of 1180, I've got 1089, rather than 1503, I've got 1329, this would be the BIC that would be most favored. And I you know, present that as an example of the fact that looking at influential observations is important. Take a look at, you know, I'm also slightly improving my TLI values relative to what I had before. And so that makes it a step that you might want to consider. Um, and what I had wanted to do is to consider now looking at longitudinal invariance questions in a data set. So the example that I'm looking at here is a manifest variable across eight measurement occasions, which has to do with something called the brief symptom inventory. It's a measure of psychological distress. And even though it seems to operate in such a fashion that you'd say that you're only looking at the past two weeks, we found that the BSI looks pretty stable. Well, one model I can do longitudinally is to estimate 
a factor mean shift data set. So what I'm going to do is to specify the manifest variable intercept across all eight measurement occasions is the same. And I'm going to make the further assumption that the autoregressive paths are the same. And I'll do the same thing for men versus women. Well, because I've set all of these intercepts to be the same, that is, I didn't freely estimate time one, time two, time three to be the same across sexes. I constrained them to be identical over time. I get to estimate means that are different across men and women. So the difference between this diagram and what you saw earlier is in the earlier diagram, I would constrain the intercepts to be the same across group, but now I'm constraining the intercepts to be the same across time. And in order to fit this model, I still need to fix one group to have a variance that's fixed at one. So I decided that you know, maybe women would be my reference group. And if this model is true, you know, men are less variable than women and slightly, you know, ever so slightly less distressed than women. You can fit that model. It's a possibility. And we can again come in and look at all of our invariance hypotheses. I might, however, change my beliefs about measurement here and say that only measurement occasions two through measurement occasions seven are the same and let the first factor loading be different across the groups. In this data set, it's a college data set. The first fact, the first measurement occasion is the freshman, fall of the freshman year. And you know, that gives me the following BIC and TLI and RMSEA that look really kind of nice. If I constrain them to be absolutely the same across groups, well, the TLI is identical as before, but my BIC value is slightly higher. And what I'm doing down here in the table is walking through all of those measurement models that I had before. <clears throat> so if I simply had a factor mean shift model, if I had no autoregressive paths, these are the models that I would have in here. If I wanted to have a random intercept model, that is, I'm going to come upstairs and say that the variance is one, but all of these factor loadings are the same. Here's what my invariance model is. And the point of this, of going through this, is to show that multiple group invariance is not an end in itself. If you you know, Google multiple group invariance in YouTube or on the web generally, you'll see lots of diagrams like what we showed at the top of the hour. But no one really explores the fact that your measurement model, is this a single factor? Is it a tau equivalent model? Is it a random intercept model? You know, those are things that you can explore in your assessment of whether things are invariant over the course of time. Um, and that, you know, basically is what I had wanted to say about multi-group factor invariance. It is possible to also do multiple group invariance inside of Onyx itself. I have to prep that for you and give you a diagram. It's one of those things that it's easier to show you interactively rather than just send you a diagram. The bad news about doing it inside of Onyx is it's not going to give you the multi-group script for M plus or Levon. You'll have to you know, write a program like we talked about last time. This seems like a good place to break. Um, the next thing that I would like to do, given that some of you are doing uh, exploratory factor analyses of scales, is to talk about exploratory factor models. And I'm going to start that off with a lecture looking at the R platform because 
some things for exploratory factor analysis are just a little bit easier to do inside of R and it's visual, but um, I'll try on Friday to do the multi-group invariance model inside of Onyx and then open up the box on this next chapter. Any questions? <laughs>